and welcome to Dove Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video, we'll be exploring the concept of water scarcity and some potential solutions. To kind of put it into perspective, if all the water on the earth were stored in a standard 18 liter water cooler bottle, the amount of available fresh water for us would fill only three teaspoons. And that water isn't necessarily evenly distributed around the world, especially in relationship to population densities. Drinking, sanitation, and hygiene needs can constitute the basic human survival needs for water. These minimum needs total about 50 liters or 13.2 gallons per day per person. Now the average American uses well over 10 times that amount. In 2000, it was reported that there were 55 countries with a combined population over a billion that averaged well below that level. Now, a country will see water stress when there's less than 1,300 cubic meters per person per year for all of the major functions. It's actually considered to be a scarce resource when there's less than 1,000 cubic meters per person. Now, these numbers, this concept of stress or scarcity doesn't take into account uh, the quality of water, the access to water, or the irregularity of the availability due to droughts or storms or seasonal changes. It just gives us an idea of how much water is available in relationship to the population. You can see, based upon our map, uh, those that are in brown are areas that were already stressed in 2000. By 2025, those in the peach color are going to be water-stressed and water-scarce countries. Those that are in the dark blue or the kind of the light bluish gray are those that will see no stress or very low stress. So we're very fortunate as a country that we'll be less stressed, but that doesn't mean there will be times where drought um, or access is going to be a problem like it's been in California lately. Now, water shortages can be caused by natural cycles of drought, higher use by growing populations, wasting water, or the pollution of water resources. This is a map of the Charlottesville Albemarle kind of water supply. If you're on the public water, um, you're getting uh, your water either from the Sugar Hollow Reservoir, uh, which then gets pumped through the Sugar Hollow Pipeline to the Ragged Mountain Reservoir. Uh, which you've heard about that and how we're going to kind of increase the height of the dam so that we can hold more volume. We also have the South Fork Ravana Reservoir. Now currently we have enough uh, water available per person, but um, there's many questions about what's going to happen as our population grows. So um, that's where our focus has been on the Ragged Mountain Reservoir. Um, there was some debate of whether or not we should dredge it to increase the depth or to build the new dam. And so currently the plan is to raise the height of the dam so that we will have uh, more volume of water. So raising a height of a dam or dredging are two ways that you can increase the amount of water that's available in a reservoir. But there are other strategies that we can do um, in order to perhaps have access to water um, into the future. Uh, one potential uh, option would be to withdraw more groundwater to, to make better use of the water that's below the ground. Perhaps we can uh, build some uh, additional dams and create new reservoirs. Uh, we can transfer water from water rich areas to water poor areas. We might could desalinate. We could convert that 70% salt water into some fresh water. Or perhaps we could just use our water more efficiently so that we have more water into the future. So we're going to discuss each one of these and kind of look at their pros and cons. So our first potential way to have access to more water is just to pump more out of the ground. Now, there are some positive aspects of this. Well, it's accessible pretty much year-round uh, based upon how much was available and recharged from a previous year. If it's underground, we're not losing it uh, as a result of evaporation. And it's pretty cheap um, to, you know, pump more water from the ground. Now, unfortunately, there are many negatives. Um, if you over pump, if you over draft the water from the ground, it can actually deplete the aquifer. And if we pump it faster than the water uh, comes back in, it could lead to uh, sinkholes and ground subsidence. 
Additionally, if we're pumping groundwater out and we're near the coastline, as we're pumping, we can actually draw salt water into the groundwater and cause what's called salt water intrusion. In this image, we can see the concept of salt water intrusion. Um, these wells that are close to the coast, uh, this primary well, as it's pumping water faster than it can be replaced from the groundwater, we actually are able to pull that salt water in. And now that salt water is permanently going to have contaminated that particular well. And so even if uh, we waited a while, there's still going to be residual salt. And so that well is going to be permanently contaminated. We've been pumping uh, groundwater uh, for a long time. And in the United States, we're actually withdrawing it four times faster than it can be replaced. The Ogawa Aquifer is the world's largest aquifer, and it's found um, here in the Midwest. And in the red areas, you can see that we're actually pumping it too fast, and some of the wells are actually going dry. So if uh, withdrawing groundwater is not going to be our main solution, what about building dams to produce reservoirs to supply more water? Well, there are certainly some positives here as well. If you build a large enough dam, um, you can actually produce electricity through the hydroelectric uh, dam. Um, if you uh, produce a dam, you're actually going to control the flow of water uh, from upstream so there'll be less flooding downstream. And then you're going to have year-round water for irrigation for our crops. Now, some negatives is when you do uh, produce dams and create a reservoir, you're flooding land that wasn't previously um, covered by water, and so you're displacing potentially people and wildlife. You're disrupting a natural uh, stream or a river, um, and so aquatic systems like uh, for fish to be able to migrate um, from the sea to their nesting grounds is going to be disrupted. And then, of course, uh, reservoirs, especially in hot summer months, we're going to see a lot of evaporation, and so a lot of that water is potentially going to be wasted. So here's what a basic uh, hydroelectric dam would look like. We would uh, produce a, a dam across a mouth of a river, and then as that water built up, it would actually flood the surrounding land. Um, and then every so often, we could release water so that it could flow over um, the turbine and produce some cheap electricity. Now, the Colorado River has lots of dams. It has so many dams and withdrawals, it often doesn't even reach the ocean. Now, the water uh, that's withdrawn from the Colorado River Basin is mostly used in the desert areas of the United States. It also provides electricity from hydroelectric plants for the 30 million people, about a tenth of the U.S. population. But with that uh, flow disrupted so much, there's a lot of aquatic ecosystems that have been severely damaged and a lot of migrating fish um, and the organisms that rely on them that are also uh, been uh, heavily impacted. In China, in 2009, they just finished one of the world's largest dams, the Three Gorges, uh, the Three Gorges Dam. The electric output for this dam is about the same as 18 large coal-burning or nuclear power plants. It'll facilitate ship travel, uh, which would reduce uh, transportation costs. Um, so it looks like a, a pretty a good use of a river system. Unfortunately, when they flooded uh, the area to be able to produce that reservoir, it displaced 1.2 million people, which they needed to build new homes. The dam itself is built over a seismic fault and already has small cracks. The cities and things that had been flooded, um, they didn't take away the buildings or the hazardous material, so that's under that water and it's going to continually leach pollutants into the river um, throughout the life of this particular. Now, many believe that uh, there are too many dams and that some of them need to be removed for ecological reasons or because they've outlived their usefulness. One such dam that was removed recently here in Albemarle was the Woolen Mills Dam. This allowed for an opening up of uh, the river system and a restoration of that ecology. So if dams and reservoirs aren't going to be our long-term solution, then what about transferring water from one place to another? Well, certainly transferring water can make one unproductive area more productive. 
Taking water from the Colorado River and, and allowing that to irrigate the Nevada desert allowed for the construction of Las Vegas, which promoted a lot of jobs, um, investment, and helped to strengthen the local economy there. Unfortunately, this can cause severe environmental harm because we're now spreading what this water over a larger area where it's not really supposed to be. It will also encourage an unsustainable use of water in those areas where the water isn't naturally supplied, like um, uh, watering yards in that desert environment is very unsustainable. There's no reason why a lush yard should be present in a desert environment. And then there could be tension between water poor and water rich areas. Um, when you're sharing that water source, um, there's that potential for conflict. We look at um, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers or even the Nile River where we're going to be transferring water from those rivers um, into desert areas. Um, when it crosses uh, political boundaries, there's certainly going to be a chance for conflict. As California uh, was continually developed, there was a massive transfer of water uh, from the water-rich north to the water-poor south, and it's always been very controversial, especially in times of drought. They constructed a large aqueduct. Um, perhaps you've seen it in movies where they're racing through these large concrete culverts. Well, this allows for water to be transferred from the north to the south. In times of drought, when the Northern Californians have to conserve water, they oftentimes ask why, um, because they've got plenty of water, um, but they're giving some of their water to the South. And so um, there's definitely some ire there. The Aral Sea used to be the world's fourth largest freshwater lake. Water was diverted from the Aral Sea and its two feeder rivers, mostly for irrigation. And now what we have is a major ecological, economic, and health disaster. About 85% of the wetlands that were supported by the Aral Sea have been eliminated, and about 50% of the local bird and mammal species have completely disappeared. Since 1961, the sea's salinity has tripled, and the water levels have dropped by 22 meters, most likely causing 20 to 24 of the native fish species to go extinct. So far, none of our solutions have been perfect. So let's take a look at desalination to see if maybe that's a more viable solution. Desalinization is taking the salt out of seawater. Now there's two basic ways that we can desalinate, and that's through distillation and reverse osmosis. When we distill seawater, you take your seawater and you're going to heat it up, and that's going to allow for the water to evaporate, leaving behind the salt in its solid form. The water then is condensed and then collected uh, to be used in drinking water or for sanitation. With reverse osmosis, you use high pressure to force seawater through a membrane filter. And so then the salt stays in and the water gets pushed out. Now, there's certainly a positive to desalinization is that there's a whole lot of water that's available to desalinate. But there are many cons to this. Removing salt from seawater by current methods is very, very expensive. It also requires a large amount of energy. So really, we've only seen this process uh, utilized in areas like the Middle East, where you have access to a lot of fossil fuels for that energy source, and really the sea is their only source of water. Another big issue is it produces a lot of salty wastewater that has to be disposed of safely. If we just put that salt water back in to the ocean, its density is going to cause it to sink to the bottom. And uh, it's going to have very low oxygen, and so it will cause these, you know, basically highly salty dead zones. So we have to find ways that we can kind of dispose of that salt appropriately. And then the big intake turbines that pull the water in can potentially kill lots of marine life. Now, as I said, we really only see a lot of desalinization in places like the Middle East. But with the recent droughts in California, they're actually bringing on line several desalination plants. The residents will likely face an increased utility cost, but the experts argue that they'd rather pay more than not have access to water. Most environmentalists are going to say that the best way for us to have water into the future is to waste less and use less water. 65 to 70 percent of the water that we use 
actually gets lost through evaporation, leaks, and other losses. So by fixing leaks, by using water-saving technologies like low-flow fixtures or drip irrigation, by recollecting and using wastewater, and then also holding on and using rainwater instead of allowing it just to, to uh, wash away um, and run off from the surfaces like our roofs, we'll actually cut down on water waste and water uses so that we'll have more water into the future. With growing populations and a finite supply of water, it's going to be essential for us to find ways to uh, maximize our water use so that everyone will have access to clean water into the future.